This is David Wheatley, and welcome to David Wheatley's podcast, episode four. We're going to spend all of episode four going over how great episodes one, two, and three were. We're going to hit all the highlights and basically have it be a review. And then uh, see where we are with that. So we set out to just have some musings. And so we've done that to see what came out. And what has come out is something about Los Angeles, about freeways, topography, hills and mountains. We talked some about music intervals and dissonance and compared that to cognitive dissonance. And then we started combining some intervals, two of them at a time, which made three at a time to make triads, T-R-I-A-D. And then from there, we talked some about defense theory. And I said we'd be coming back with some more defense theories because I had run out of the ones that I could remember. Also, since the first one, we have added music. We've added photographs, a burst of photos. We have some ending music, and the podcasts are gradually taking shape. So let's talk again a little bit more about the, uh, the use of uh, defense theory to protect ourselves from incoming. And I talked a little bit about denial, the kid with the Hershey bar with almonds saying I didn't do it, wasn't even there. And some people repress things so they don't even remember them later, which is in some cases a very, very good idea. Some people will blame others and say, well, it was them instead, shifting blame and responsibility. Some people will react by having age regressions. And I heard this guy talk one time, he was a psychologist. He said he would assess a prospective client based on their chronological age and their intellectual age, how much they knew and also their emotional age. And I thought about that since. It would be fairly easy to come up with chronological age. And it would be fairly easy to come up with intellectual age. How much have they studied? Do they have degrees? Do they keep reading books? Who do they hang out with? But this emotional age really intrigued me, partly because people in the arts generally try to connect with as many people as possible. And if there's going to be a range of intellectual age, let's say IQ would be one way to test that. Up and down, maybe we have a few geniuses and a whole lot of people in the middle. You know, a few other people are trying to keep up. That everybody would have an emotional age of some kind. And so it occurred to me that when somebody's having a tantrum, maybe they're having an emotional age regression down to four or six, like a kid that knocks over all the blocks on the floor of the living room. They have a living room. And then there are people who are wise beyond their years. Maybe that's intellectual instead. So the emotional age, as I see it, can go up and down very, very rapidly, moment to moment almost. It's been suggested that I say that I'm not a psychologist. I don't know why I didn't think to mention that in the first place, but my formal training is as a musician. Musician, I have, I like to brag right about now because I worked hard for these. I have four degrees in music. Two are from the Royal Conservatory of Music in honors performance, one in classical piano, one in classical pipe organ. And I have a bachelor of music degree in composition from the University of North Texas, which used to be called North Texas State. And I hear some clunking outside, which is kind of nice because it makes us sound like we're actually in the world, which is an advantage. And maybe there's some construction or choreography going on out there, and we'll invite them in to be part of our podcast. Who knows? And then the other degree I have is uh, from the University of Southern California, otherwise known as USC, a master's in composition. Composition is, I've generally thought of it as being executive function. We composers create music from wherever it comes and we write it down 
or find a way to communicate it and then other musicians uh, play it. So we're basically telling people what to do and I'm totally fine with that. And so back to the chronological and emotional age, an artist who can create art that connects with people emotionally, especially hopefully with a lower emotional age, commonality would be able to have a mass market appeal and projects that can communicate to that many people at once. This tends to be rhythm oriented, a groove, repetition of music, repetition of passages, where people can learn whatever that repetition is and enjoy it without having to reflect too much on the changes from one passage to the next. Okay, sublimation. I've got this awesome printout here with thanks. Uh, intellectualization, boy, that's a good word. That's the kind of word that I like. So we'll come to come back to that as well. I'd like to talk a little bit now about a class I took. And um, because I play the piano and the pipe organ, most pipe organs in, are in churches. So I've played a lot of music in churches and worked in churches. Uh, professionally, and I've done some volunteer work there as well. And so one evening, the uh, I was not needed because the young people of the church were doing the service, which means they drag a few couches out onto the platform and kick back like it's a basement of their parents' home, and they do the service. So I found myself going out, I think, to the Santa Monica Pier or somewhere out there to see if there was any improv classes going on. I watched an improv show, picked up a flyer on the outside, which said, come to Second City and take one of our classes. So I said, all right, cool. Because I had been to Second City in the late 70s in Chicago and saw a show there and it was fantastic. So I found out that the only class that was available was on a Friday and it was for actors and I wasn't an actor. I said, well, can I come and observe? So they said, sure. So I get there at the beginning of the class, ask the instructor, can I observe? not an actor. And he says, sure. He says, would you like to participate in the exercises? I said, yeah, if I can. So I got in a circle with everybody, did what they did. And then at the end of the exercises, he says, do you want to be in the class? I said, sure, I'd love to be in the class. So that was my first improv class. And part of what we studied had to do with um, status. We would do these two-person scenes. One would be with the king and the servant. Another would be with two roommates, and one's the pushy one, and the other one is the milk toast one. And it would actually turn out that the one with the lower status was actually in charge and messing with and manipulating the one who was in the higher status. And I particularly enjoyed seeing that. And sometimes they would actually change roles in the middle of a scene. The one in charge would convert to being the one who was a lower status, and to see how they both did with that. And because this is an informal podcast, we should probably find out how far we are into this because we didn't bother to set that. But it feels like about seven or eight minutes, so let's assume it's seven or eight minutes. I hear some more clunking. It seems to be getting louder, so it looks like they really want to be part of our podcast. So they're getting closer and closer. The environment here is pretty cool. It looks kind of uh, like the building has been redone, especially to create this set. So it makes me wonder what was here before, going back in time through generations. So in the next podcast, I'm going to fill you in on my theory called the amoeba theory. And now I know you all really, really want to hear that but you're just going to have to be patient and wait. I know cognitive dissonance, we shouldn't have to wait, but now we have to wait. Anxiety, excitement. See how all of these podcasts build on each other? One paragraph and one theory, they just keep adding and adding until we end up with something that's totally unmanageable. And that's the purpose of a, of a podcast is to overwhelm everybody so they have to listen from the top again and we get more views. And that's the whole purpose of it. So that said, we're going to end uh, 
episode number four right here. And if you look in the notes down below, uh, there'll be a reference to Patreon. If you want to be a patron of the arts, this would be a good place to be one. And we hope you'll do that. So with that said, this is David Wheatley signing off. Thank you.